So thanks everybody for joining us today. This is the Green Left Show episode number six. Uh, and today we're discussing the recent developments regarding sexual assault, uh, which has been a, a dramatic issue in Australian politics recently, and also uh, related to that, the important question of um, how we can tackle sexual violence in our society. I wanted to acknowledge at the outset that we are uh, recording this on stolen Aboriginal land. I'm here coming from Jagera Turbul country in uh, so-called Brisbane. And uh, I also want to um, make mention that uh, if, you, if you like the work that we do and you want to support our work, the best way you can support us is to become a Green Left supporter. And the link is in the, in the description below. And we're also at the moment celebrating our 30th anniversary of Green Left. And we have a big celebration coming up on March 27. Again, there's a link in the description. You're welcome to join us. And we're also still uh, welcoming messages of support for that 30th anniversary. Now, as I mentioned, we're, we're recording this on a Thursday. Uh, so just yesterday uh, for us, we have just seen Christian Porter's uh, speech in Parliament. Uh, before that, there was been sexual assault allegations or rape allegations against uh, in Parliament House against uh, federal start parliamentary staffers. Uh, and we've seen the um, uh, and we've seen you know, other issues as well, like you know, just only a couple of weeks ago, the family court was abolished, which is going to have a big impact on domestic violence victims uh, more than, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible development. So we've got, we definitely have a terrible problem of sexual assault uh, in our society. But I guess especially Christian Porter's speech yesterday was very dramatic because uh, he uh, almost, well, I mean, I don't think anyone of, anyone of us here will say it's unbelievable, but it definitely was sort of dramatic and shocking that uh, he expects us to take him seriously, that there is uh, that there's nothing to see here, and that uh, and that even that even calling an inquiry threatens the rule of law in Australia. Well, that's that's an outrageous proposition. So we're here today to discuss this issue with uh, some important activists. Uh, first of all, we have Janine Henry, who is uh, involved in the Women March for Justice, and we'll be hearing more about that in a few moments. And uh, Janine has got a number of uh, strings to her bow. We're also hearing from Sarah Hathaway, who is a trade union organiser based in the health sector and a Green Left journalist and uh, author of the recent article, uh, Gendered Violence, a Disease in Our Workplaces article. And Kamala Emanuel, who is a social science member, a long time feminist, uh, and we're, we're glad to have you all here today with us on the show. Uh, so I think, first of all, I think we'll take it in turns. Maybe Janine, do you want to start? Uh, just in response to this, uh, to this recent developments that we've seen in, um, in, in federal parliament and beyond. Thank you so much. I um, I certainly think uh, Porter's uh, press yesterday um, was really a capstone on what has been a shocking 12, 18 months in um, not only the Australian Parliament, but in many other major institutions in Australia. And I could spend um, all evening picking apart Porter's press release or presser yesterday. But I think the thing that I took away from it was, you know, on one hand, he's saying, well, I can't answer to these allegations because I've not actually been presented with any allegations. But on the other hand, he's saying, but then I deny the allegations. And I think the, uh, the overt hypocrisy in that was really the, the final straw. But as I said to you, this has been a long time coming. And I was thinking about the issue this afternoon. And for me, um, you know, I was marching for equal rights for women in the 1980s as a university student. And I wanted to believe that we had actually got there, that Australia was indeed a advanced, society where there was true equality between men and women. But I think actually what's happened is that uh, the boats got leaky and um, a lot of middle-aged misogynistic blokes have jumped into that boat and they are pushing the gap away further and further. And so what we're seeing is instead of, you know, closing the gap, 
that is being pushed aside. And whilst equality remains such a huge issue in our environment, we're going to see an increase of this um, sexual assault and sexual abuse of women. It's systemic. And what is upsetting the, the me enough to um, step out of my near retirement and um, harness the anger of a whole lot of women to, to stage these... Um, to stage these rallies is enough is enough. We've actually actually had enough. And, and when the leaders and our role models in society are obscuring sexual assault and sexual harassment and hiding this and then hiding behind the very institutions that support them, we are in deep trouble as a society and this has to be blown open right here, right now. Porter is our top lawmaker in this country. The Prime Minister leads this country. We've seen what happened in the court system with Dyson last year. These people make laws that affect all of us and if those laws are not coming from a um, basis of equality and treating woman, women with equality, we are no further forward. And you know what? I'm pretty damned angry. I thought this was, I'd done and dusted this when I was a university student. And the fact that I'm here as a 57 year old with gray hair, having to get off my comfortable sofa and do it all again is making me pretty damn angry. And I can tell you there's a few other women, you know, one or two others out there that are also pretty damned angry. Sarah, your article focused on uh, Brittany, Hig Brittany Higgins' issue, but also the workplace culture across the country. So do you want to talk about your reactions to the last few weeks and also, and also the contents of your article? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have to say I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling about the same as Janine, pretty angry. And honestly, I wish I could say on some level I'm surprised or shocked, but I'm really not. Um, and I think I touched on a lot of this in the article um, that I wrote for Green Left. And, and now I'm like, I'm adding to that list as we're speaking now. But, um, you know, Janine's mentioned that the Dyson Hayden High Court um, and the, the uncovering of um, sexism and inappropriate behaviour there. There's women in the legal system in Tasmania that are, are campaigning now as we speak against a toxic sexist culture in their industry. Um, we've seen the peak body for health, uh, health professionals, APRA, surveying medical professionals and students entering the field and far too many are responding with um, accounts of bullying and harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and a few years ago, when I was a uh, uni student on campus at the time, we had the big sort of uncovering of sexual harassment on campuses and how um, universities were implicit in covering this up. So now, you know, as Janine says, it's our highest lawmaker in the country. It's the leader of our country. Um, basically, you know, stitching this up, protecting each other, protecting the boys club. Not at all shocked because, you know, it's happening everywhere. It is sy systematic. Um, but I think one of the things I tried to touch on my article is that it is happening everywhere. It's happening in sort of blue collar, white collar, low paid, high paid, every industry, every sector you can think of gendered violence is happening in the workplace. But I just get this sense that sometimes when these stories are coming out, say from the high court or from parliament, the level of shock from the public seems to be higher. It's almost, um, and, you know, rightly so, maybe we hold these people to a higher higher standard. They're our elected representat representatives. They have a high level of education. But, you know, maybe when we hear stories of women in casualised hospitality work or, um, you know, women working on the farms, I just don't think we've had that strong a public reaction. So there's a bit of a you know, yeah, okay, like shrug for some women, but when it happens in parliament, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different level of reaction. But if it's not okay in one area, well, it's not okay anywhere. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Sarah, and I think that's a really, um, a really important and valid point. Um, but I, I, I make the point only that um, I do believe that um, our parliamentarians, I do believe that our Prime Minister and indeed our Attorney General should 
by factor of their position, be held to higher standards. They absolutely should be. They are being paid by the public serve purse. They should be held to, to um, higher standards. But that doesn't ameliorate the fact that you rightly pointed out, this is not okay anywhere. It is not okay in the local cafe. It is not okay for a casualised worker it, anywhere. Um, but it most certainly is not. And the reason um, the reason I would put forth is that these people are role models. Yeah. They are absolutely role models. And I've got a 16-year-old son and I'm trying to, doing my utmost to raise him to, to treat everyone equally. But when he looks out there, into the world and he sees our Prime Minister and the senior cabinet, cabinet ministers all covering up an alleged rape, then they're his um, role models. Mm. And then we've got this issue that's coming out of Sydney at the moment with this, this lovely young girl that, that's starting to um, write down the stories of all these horrific sexual crimes that um, is occurring in the private school system in Australia. And you think, well, of course that is going to happen because our leaders are saying, it's okay, mate, we'll support you. Um, and it's just filtering down the system and down the system. And it is systemic and it is dangerous and it is wrong. And it has to stop right here, right now. So, Kamala, I mean, I think clearly we should not be holding politicians and these leaders in Canberra to a higher standard, but is it shocking that these people that come from privileged backgrounds oftentimes feel this sense of entitlement and, and more generally your responses for the last few weeks? Yeah. I, I don't think it is um, a surprise. I, I think if we look at the structures of society where there's the interlocking, interlocking hierarchies of, of coercion and control uh, around not only gender but also race and class, um, I, I think we, we can see a, a range of ways that um, powerful, rich white men uh, are made to feel like they have entitlement on a whole range of, a whole range of areas. And one of the dreadful ways that that's uh, played out is in, uh, in relation to entitlement to women's bodies. Um, and of course, it's not only rich white men who perpetrate um, rape and, and sexual assault and, and sexual misconduct of various kinds but there there's there is something that gives them more protection when they do and there's something that um that facilitates it uh by virtue of the the many ways that they they particularly hold power and of course you know i i think we all know it's not not all rich white men of course but but the those those structures are in place that that give give cover and we've we've seen it in Scott Morrison coming out and more or less not using these words, but standing shoulder to shoulder, um, just in in the way that we've come to see the um, the powerful men in Parliament do when something like this emerges, and I I think there are like a range of a range of things that feed into Parliament in particular being a place where this happens, but it is completely I agree with um, everything the others have said about it being a structural uh, you know, phenomenon. Um, but, but in particular in Parliament, I mean, it's, it's a, an institution itself that is a reflection of ruling class power and the people who occupy those positions of power, uh, you know, play such a, a role of, of power in our society. But just some things that we said about um, the things that we Alex, you brought up um, early on about the um, this idea that the rule of law is going to be uh, w would be um, would be undermined if Christian Porter were to step down. And I wanted to to pick out that a little bit because um, just taking on the idea that Janine raised that the politicians and particularly those in in government, those in cabinet, uh, those with these you know amazingly powerful um, positions, that they should be held to a higher account. Now, it's not going to be possible to if um, and I'll just say if if Christian Porter raped someone thirty three years ago, it's 
because of her death, it's not going to be possible to have him go to jail, which is where he would belong if that's what's happened. Um, so that's not going to be possible. So, so for, he's not going to face justice. So whatever, um, whatever inquiry might be able to be established, it's not going to be a, a, a dealing with the question of um, guilt beyond all reasonable doubt um, and, and is this a person who needs to be in jail. So when they talk about, oh, the rule of law is under threat, it's, it's just garbage. It's complete garbage. It's completely about the smokescreen, about baffling us with bullshit and, um, and just, you know, putting forward some, some more uh, protection for, for the mates. Because um, what people are demanding and, and what we should be demanding is some kind of commission of inquiry, some form of inquiry, some kind of independent inquiry at arm's length from all of those in the, this, this Canberra bubble where positions of power and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, some, some cohort of people with, um, with legitimacy, with experience, who can weigh, weigh what's known, weigh what can be known and, and make recommendations. Because we just need to know is, and I think we're seeing it, is Porter someone who should hold the position of Attorney General? Um, is he someone who should be a member of parliament? The, these are, is he someone who should be in the cabinet? These are, are important questions. If Scott Morrison can't see that he's not someone who should be attorney general in his cabinet, um, in his government, then, then yes, we definitely do need some kind of inquiry to investigate or weigh it, make recommendations and, and have those acted on. Um, because this is, um, this is otherwise it is outstanding. And for Scott Morrison to say, Basically, there's nothing to see here. I've referred this to the police. There's nothing I have to do. A bit like in the fires. Oh, well, I'm not a firefighter. That's up to the states. You know, it, it's this hand washing. Don't ask me. It's not my problem. And, and it isn't good enough. Uh, it's, it, and it's, and it's based on a lie that this would undermine the rule of law. It wouldn't undermine the rule of law. It would give people confidence that the people who are involved in administering justice, um, are scrutinized and, and do need to be of a, of a high standard, um, uh, in order to be able to judge or administer justice or to, to oversee our justice system. Uh, and, and, and similarly, the question of this being a hyper-politicised hyper system, a hyper-politicised moment that Christian Porter was also referring to when he was talking in terms of, you know, oh, poor me, the, um, the victim here. Um, uh, everything's so politicised today, I couldn't possibly get a fair trial in whatever, you know, kind of inquiry might be set up. Um, what, is, what he means, and we shouldn't make any quick, you know, doubt about this, what he means when he says this is a hyper-politicised moment or whatever expression it was, is he's talking about the Me Too movement. He's talking about the Order of Australia being um, presented to someone who's speaking out about child sexual assault. He's talking about the fact that we are having a conversation nationally as well as globally about men in positions of a power abusing that um, to... Uh, to um, uh, exert you know sexual assault and and sexual harassment and and other forms of sexual misconduct against women um particularly against women who they're in a, like positions doubly positions of power so the moment that he's referring to that he doesn't think he can get a fair hearing in is the moment that we all need it's a moment when we start saying oh if a woman raises something we're going to start with saying oh this is more than plausible you know could this have happened instead of saying oh no that couldn't have possibly happened we say yeah this could have happened yeah, I believe that. I believe that's possible. I believe I believe she's right. Um, and so when he says that, we need to be scrutinising what does that even mean. Um, yes, we do want it to be a moment where we, he has to face scrutiny. Janine, we'll go back to you. I mean, surely one of the most inspiring results of this uh, situation is the response that has, uh, that has uh, spontaneously sort of generated. And we've got the International Women's Day rallies coming up this weekend. But more uh, dramatically, I think, there is the, the, the Women's March for Justice, which is on March 15. Can you please just tell us how this Women's March for Justice came about and tell us the response, tell us what you're organising? Uh, look, it was phenomenal. It, um, I put a tweet up on Sunday evening and just said it was a bit of an angry tweet. And um, in that tweet, I just said, um, you know, enough already. This has to stop. We are fed up. And the tweet essentially went viral and um, I put up a proposal that um, we should uh, dress in black and um, circle Parliament House with our backs to Parliament House in protest. And um, from there, the idea started to gain some uh, traction. So I set up a quick um, Facebook group 
and uh, woke up Monday morning and there were 5,000 people had joined this um, Facebook group and I knew that this was something really big. So I joined forces with uh, and found um, some absolutely amazing um, women, as it turns out. And within 48 hours, we had um, amassed around 40,000 um, people who were also very angry, men and women. And we um, set up our website. So our website went um, live yesterday, um, sorted out our socials and put together a plan. So uh, March 15, um, we had originally wanted to march on um, International Women's Day, but Parliament's not sitting. And I think uh, we felt that it was really important that um, that um, the people whom we are so disgruntled with are actually in Parliament. So um, we will have our main march in uh, Canberra. We've got um, some amazing speakers um, coming along. Um, the marches are occurring in all capital cities at 12 noon on the um, March 15. We have asked participants to wear black, um, a symbolism of our morning. And, um, you know, it's time, it's time to move on. And we are demanding justice and demanding that this happens right here, right now. And we want our allies, we want our supporters to come along because we need, we need good men, we need good women, we need good young people, we need good old people, we need people who are on Tuesday morning going to go back into their workplaces and they are going to stand up and say no more. We need people that are going to call out this behaviour because what we've seen in Canberra, what we saw in the Dyson case in the High Court, what we see in the tea shops and the hospitals and the restaurants is that people are complicit, they enable this behaviour. And we are saying, enough. It's time for all of us collectively to call it out. If you see it, call it out. It has to stop. So please come and march with us at 12 noon, Monday, March 15, in all your capital um, cities except Western Australia, which is actually on the Sunday. Um, and just, you know, this has to, this has to stop. I do not want another three-year inquiry to come around and tell us that there is perhaps inequity in our political institutions. These are the highest institutions of our land. They set our law. We'll put the website into the into the video description so people can check it out there. But are there, is, is there anything else you want to say about how people can get involved and and what you're hoping to achieve on the day? Yeah, actually, look, look, come, come along. It would be fantastic if you can um, support us, follow us on. Um, we've now got all comms and um, I'm getting help from um, my teenager in learning about TikTok. But I am determined that I will um, sort out this and I will be the TikTok queen um, because we want people from the Snapchat, TikTok, through to Facebook ages, if we can track them, um, to come along and um, support us. You can support us. I've got to go fund me so you can support us financially. But most of all, we want warm bodies on the ground with your top to toe black, black headwear, please. And um, come and just get angry with me because you know what? Um, my top's going to pop if I get any more angry and I need to share this anger with other people. So, I mean, Kamala, I'm sure you'll be supporting this, um, this uh, March, Women's March for Justice, but perhaps can you make some comments about how this campaign, or, or I, guess, I guess more broadly, uh, how have the advances we've made in women's rights been achieved over, over the last hundred years or so? Well, it's just the kind of thing that Janine's doing, really. It's, it's women coming to, particularly, I mean, Generally speaking, oppressed groups organise themselves and then, you know, others come in behind and support them. And um, for, for women, it's, um, you know, around a whole range of things. It's been women organising to um, to defend their rights in, in masses. And um, what we know about, there is a study that looked at a whole bunch of countries and at least might have been 40 countries or, or the top 40 anyway, that in terms of, um, you know, rape, sexual assault, where, where progress had been made, 
was very strongly correlated with where were campaign movements um, to end sexual violence and, and to end violence against women. And I think uh, it, it's very clear why there's the link because, you know, you get in the streets, you raise awareness and you start pushing back and that can have structural impacts and it can have, um, and it can have just individual and psychological and social impacts, cultural impacts. And I think we need to be, I, I think that the kinds of things that have been effective at raising the status of women you know, in a whole range of areas have been things that try to, you know, would, would tackle, you know, situation in workplace, situation in, in culture and representation, um, situation in representation. Like there are a whole lot of different aspects and I don't think we can just do one and ignore the others. So I think, you know, there's holding individuals to account but there's other things that we need to do as well to, to change the kind of structural things. But um, it's definitely clear that from questions of vote, equal, you know, equality in the workplace, uh, abortion rights, uh, what it, whatever it may be, that it's when we collectively identify there's a problem and push back together that that's where we've always been the strongest. And Zara, women's rights are union business. Do you have any, any comments on the on the trade union involvement in? women's struggles for justice? Absolutely. I mean, um, I've sort of approached this from, from a workplace perspective, but we know that, you know, violence against women happens everywhere in the home, in campus, on the streets and um, in the workplace. But, um, yeah, certainly in Victoria, Victorian Trades Hall and the union movement have been um, campaigning around gendered violence at work for a long time. Um, and that includes... Um, you know, trying to get people to see this as an OH&S issue because it is an OH&S issue. Um, it, you know, it costs employers money, like if you want to put a dollar figure on it in terms of work cover claims, people quitting, you know, constantly having to retrain staff. Um, so, you know, we have, we've been hearing a lot of talk about, you know, we've got to fix, fix the workplace culture, fix the workplace culture. Yes, that is one element to it. Um, but, you know, nothing sort of, you know, happens in a vacuum either. So we're never going to have a perfect workplace. You're never going to have, um, you know, 100% safety for women in any context until we sort of address um, this broader societal thing. But, you know, I have certainly been impressed by the level of organising that women have been doing in their unions in the last, um, you know, handful of years. I think there's a lot more work there to do. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of hardworking activists that are in some cases dragging unions and dragging their leadership to address these issues that are impacting on 50% of the workforce and they are issues that unions need to be taking up. So uh, compared to 100 years ago, uh, clearly there are a lot more formal rights for women than there were uh, then. I mean, certainly the right to vote, but even like the right to get a mortgage, the right, you know, work, rights at work, for example, not having to resign once um, getting married, etc. Uh, equal anti-discrimination laws. There's a whole lot of legal advances that have been made over that last hundred years. But surely the events of the last two weeks have shown us that formal equality is not enough. So Kamala, perhaps I would turn to you and see if you, you rate, make some comments about, um, about how do we achieve meaningful uh, meaningful justice for women uh, beyond just formal equality? Well, I, I think it is important to have measures that we see as the immediate demands we're making to end violence against women and to see that there are some demands that have to be put directly on men. Um, and there are some demands that we need to fight for collectively that, as I said before, are more structural. So I want to talk about some of those. Um, for instance, when I think it's been a really valuable, uh, you know, a, a aspect of consciousness raising that women have been saying for a long time, stop with the victim blaming and start telling men not to perpetrate violence, um, to, to tell men not to rape women um, and stop asking, you know, what was she wearing, how much had she had to drink and, and, and all these sort of things that end up putting it on, you know, just enable rape. By and, and other forms of violence by suggesting that it's women who need to behave themselves in order to not invite these uh, these things to happen. So so putting the onus on men to not rape uh, is is I think a, a very very important and, and and critical thing. On on top of that, we also need to just 
look at the things that make women vulnerable to sexual assault, uh, in, embedded in the unequal power that exists between men and women from the, the family system to the workplace and beyond. Um, because uh, what we can see from societies that aren't, you know, that aren't or weren't part of, you know, Western civilization with class division, state, private property, is that there are, there are and have been other ways of organizing society that aren't based on the kinds of hierarchies of power and control um, and, and where, it's, where rape isn't a thing that occurs. And, and so what we, what we can tell from that, the societies that first encountered rape because of colonization and were completely horrified that such a thing could occur. Or, or, or yeah, so, so we, we know that it's, it's not innate, it's not inevitable. Um, there are structures in our kind of society that, um, that make it possible and, and that, uh, that facilitate it and that engender it. And I think the family system is, is, is part of the origin of it in, and, and slavery, um, where, where men had access to women's bodies and where, you know, where the, the marriage contract was, was basically drawn up as woman stops being the property of her father and becomes the property of her husband. Um, you know, that it's only just probably, I don't know, a little over 50 years or something in that vicinity um, since rape in marriage was recognised as an actual thing. Um, so on the one hand, we can say we've come a long way, um, but there's more to dismantle uh, in the things that generate the ideas in men's heads that think, make them think it is okay to rape women. Um, and, and we have to tackle that. And I think our, our rallies and so forth that say, look, you've just got to stop this are, are a critical element of that. But then there's also what can we do to actually empower women to raise the status of women so that women aren't economically, socially, morally, or in any other way dependent on men and therefore unable to escape situations that, that structure them in. So, so workplaces where uh, the boss has the, this coercive power, uh, domestic relationships where a, a male partner has this coercive power. And so uh, we need to, to look at dismantling those actual structures and creating a new kind of egalitarian society. Uh, and ultimately, I think you, you've got to say, we do have to revolutionize every institution in society in order to do what um, Abdullah Öcalan uh, calls killing the dominant male, uh, metaphorically. So Sarah, comments from you about how do we raise the status of women uh, and also, I guess, achieving fundamental liberation more you know, in a fundamental way. Yeah, well, I think it's, yeah, it's hard because you can see it and go like, look at all the things we've achieved in the last, you know, decade, two decades. And then, you know, this happens in Parliament and you feel like beating your head against a wall going like, <laughs> we haven't got anywhere and it's still happening and where are we going? But um, I think probably a key area, which is really multifaceted, if you wanted to drill into it, is this our question of economic equality between women, because until you address that real material basis of inequality, um, I just can't see things progressing. Um, and there's so there's so many elements to this, and Kamal has touched on it, but, um, you know, the easy one to point to is unpaid domestic labour, so the labour that predominantly women are doing in the home around um, caring for children and family and, and elders in the family. But, um, you know, we've got massive sectors of, low paid feminized work that is not valued so things like early childhood education um social and welfare work you know it's caring work women do it because you know they care you know weird things so we don't need to pay them a decent wage to do it um you know the disparity in super um you know the fact that you know if a woman's on new start and her partner's being abusive or she can't leave because her new start payment's based on her partner's income like all of this just contributes to um, women not being able to be independent, like economically independent. Um, and, you know, there are issues that unions are addressing, but some days I just feel like we're not doing enough and we're not moving fast enough. Um, I guess one one sort of positive that came, came out of a negative was the Rosie Batty um, case and the loss of her son has led to 
a big shift in the social and welfare sector, which, which is the area that I'm heading into. Um, but they've got a whole new framework now, which is legislated around what has to be recorded and what has to be reported. And it sounds really obvious when you talk about it, but it's su it's such a fundamental fundamental shift for the industry. Um, and where it came from was that Rosie Batty's partner had engaged in a men's shed and two other services, and at those services he disclosed thoughts of violence towards his partner or his child, and none of those services reported it because at the time it was about protecting the, the privacy of either the client or the privacy of the people around that client was more important than protecting women and children from violence. Um, and now because of this new framework has completely been tipped on its head to go, well, we don't, it's not that we don't care about privacy, but that is secondary to protecting women of children. Um, and the whole sort of centre for this is to keep the perpetrator in view. Um, so, you know, if Mary comes into a service and says, John Smith hit me, well, then the social worker has to say, Mary came in and said, John Smith hit her in the face and you name the perpetrator um, and you have to share that information. So I, that to me is a positive step. Um, and I'm reading it going, I can't believe this wasn't legislated in the first place, but um, yeah, we're, we're moving. Um, but yeah, still a long way to go. And I think the economic questions um, are, are crucial for progressing things further. And there's the old slogan, Sarah, no women's liberation without socialism, no socialism without women's liberation. Uh, and a book in recent years came out about women in Eastern Europe uh, with, the, with the provocative headline chosen by the publisher, apparently, uh, why women have better sex under socialism. It wasn't just about sex, it was also about uh, you know, women's material and, and other conditions of life in general. But any comments about, about that? question of the women's linking women's liberation with fundamental social change yeah absolutely I mean again you know it comes back to the economic question I I can't I just can't see a lot of these things being resolved under capitalism in terms of you know housing being a fundamental human right a living income for all um you know having having the right to you know have a livable pension not having to rely on you super after retirement um just all these economic questions i think it is important that we campaign around them and and seek reforms and um seek to raise a level of awareness around these issues and how they impact on women but at the end of the day we do live in <laughs> in a neoliberal society and we seem to be on this track going in a particular um, economic and political direction. So absolutely, I think women's liberation is tied up um, with a socialist view of um, economics and, and sharing the wealth um, more fairly. And again, Sarah, I will say with you for the moment, I mean, this it seems like a, a provo it seems like a provocative idea. Is it possible to have a society without rape? Uh, but I guess that's the question. What 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 are your thoughts on that? And if and if so, how do we achieve that? I think it is. Um, but again, I guess you know, is this something we, we could achieve under capitalism? And I would say no. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 a huge question. Again, there's the, it's the, the economics of it. Um, the so social position of women, the political position of women, um, you know, absolutely. I, you know, I think we can we can get to a point of a society without rape, without murder, without assault. Um, but there's so many conditions there that need to be fixed, both material and immaterial, and everything in between. Um, something to aspire to, and we need we need to keep up all the the multifaceted campaigns on all these issues that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, I think that links back to your question of or comment about, you know, no feminism without socialism and no socialism without feminism. I just, we can't get there under this current system that we live under. And I think it's all the more pressing to go, well, this is why we need to put capitalism in the bin because we're never going to see a truly fair and equ equitable society um, under this system that we're living in. And Kamala, you said earlier that 
uh, societies have existed without rape. Can you tell us more about that and can you tell us how, how do you think we move towards trying to achieve that? Yeah, look, I, I think we, there, yeah, two, those, those two elements. Firstly then, yes, societies without rape. I, there are several examples um, in even quite recent history as, as well as you know the, the far distant path. There is a lot of evidence that, um, that suggests that women have not always had the, this sort of second class status um, and, and that in fact there have been societies throughout history um, and in, in different parts of the world where women enjoyed a very high status. Um, and where rape was not thinkable. And one, um, one example is brought to an Australian audience by um, anthropologist Christine Haliwell, who spent some time with the Gerai people, who are um, a Dayak people from uh, Indonesian Borneo. And she, she recounts uh, a story and, and unpacks what happened when uh, a woman in a village where she was staying made a lot of uh, loud noise one night and um, in the morning uh, it turned out that someone had, um, a, a fellow had tried to, um, uh, had wanted to have sex with her uh, in the middle of the night in her, in her home and had fled. And, and so coming from Australia, Christine's thought was, geez, that must have been really scary. This guy wanted to rape you. Um, and, and it took quite some work and understanding and, and discussions to actually um, to try to get herself understood and, and to, to understand the, the completely different context um, that even though she'd been living there a while, she, she hadn't realised that for, for in, in, in this society, the, the, the concept of rape was unthinkable and it was unthinkable because the way people thought about what men are, what women are, even what their sex organs are, actually made it impossible to even think you could do such a thing. Um, and I can unpack that further if you like, um, but but I, I mean I think it's I think it's remarkable and and the status of the women in that society while uh, while higher than in many societies actually wasn't fully equal um, in in some aspects of the law but I, I think it certainly goes to indicate that it's it's not inevitable that rape uh, that rape occurs and so we can picture a society where we envisage what you know where we envisage our relationships where we relate to one another and to ourselves in such a way that it makes it impossible to uh, to, to imagine a person would ever even want to do such a thing um uh let alone go ahead and carry it out and and that's that's not something that in in our society it's not at all difficult to imagine people raping because we live in a society that bombards us with this concept of male sexuality as driven hydraulic uh, you know men being under impulses beyond their control and 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 the phallus is this powerful thing that can you know get can have its own way um we don't have to have a culture like that we don't have to have those conceptions of sexuality um and so there's a lot of work we need to do in that realm of ideas to to unpack well how do we talk about sex and sexuality are we going to say you know do, is it always i'll oh, get fucked you know is getting fucked something that is a bad thing that happens to you that someone else does to you you know this idea of who is the object when that's happening who's the active per person when that's happening like yeah just the, the ways we talk about sex and and you know is it is it something that someone does to someone else or is it uh, an experience that people share with one another um going from how we talk about it and and how we um how it's conveyed in the media and 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 the, how we taught about it um uh so all the way through to what happens after the event um i mean we want to do a lot to prevent it from happening in the first place there's there's the kind of there's what to do after the event you know with, with people who have committed rape what do we do well we have to go beyond the carceral response although in our society as it's set up yeah people should go to to jail um, and it should be treated as the serious crime given that we've got a system that says there's such a thing as crimes and people get locked up for those we have to start with a legal system that that implements uh, that those kind of that that version of justice even though we know that really justice is a much deeper process than just oh yeah and now he's in jail I mean we do need to keep ourselves safe um, the community needs to be safe from from pedophiles and rapists and and we need to be able to um, get those people out of our workplaces get them out of our political movements get them out of our um, you know institutions of power because no one should go into those places and have to confront their own rapist or or be threatened by someone who might be willing to rape so get them out of those positions of power now part of that means actually we have to change how um, 
power even exists, like change the court system so it's not just someone up the front dealing out justice and change the policing and change the t education system and change our religious institutions and change our families so that it's not just someone controls uh, the, the, the dynamic and, and the others have to do what they say. So we do need to you know, change, change how our institutions form but, and there's, there's also just more simple, straightforward, immediate things in between you know, education about consent and um, legislating to stop rape or to, to, um, to punish it. There's the other things like raising women's status by ensuring there's housing. So you can get, like one of the things that keeps women in um, abusive relationship it's just you know the economic repercussions of getting out of uh, out of a situation if you're in a position of economic dependence, um, and the dependence can be psychological as well. But but structurally, our economy is structured so that on the whole, by and large, more women are dependent on men than the other way around. And so we need to change that. Women need to have access to housing. Women need to have equal pay. Women need to have maternity leave because one of the big things that um, that determines that you know women don't have that much super and, and, and women's lifetime earnings are but overwhelmingly so much less than men's is you know once you start having kids, you're out of the workplace and you, if you can't maintain your seniority and you can't maintain an income, uh, you know it's all downhill from there. Um, so so we need um, we need those kind of economic uh, forms of justice of, of restoration of um, of making things equal when they haven't been equal because of the the unequal power structures. So we need, it's kind of like we we need we need to do it all and 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 not just concentrate on just one of of, of those. Although at a moment like this, yeah, coming out and loudly demanding we want the change and having a, a bit of a one two three, you know. People, people in positions of authority who abuse their power need to be stood down while it's investigated. You know, we could we could start with that, but we do need to in institute these other things as well. So, and when I say that we need to revolutionise all the institutions, I mean I, I am talking about um, eradicating the oppressive relationships in every institution, and and I think we need to to recognise that. Um, and I think Alex um, asked a, a question of Sarah before about. Uh, about the connection between socialism and women's liberation. And I think we need to see the process of decolonisation, um, of, of racial justice and um, of, of socialism, of women's liberation as all, as all fundamentally intertwined. And, and even something that I had meant to, um, to say at the outset, which was um, just you know, acknowledging where we are, is just acknowledging the impact colonisation has had on women and women's experience of, of sexual assault and, and, and rape. Um, and, and I think we can't imagine, and even just, and, and like Angela Davis talks about the, the role of um, rape in enforcing slavery um, and, and the, the way that that had an impact on, on sexualizing racialized women. And I, and I think, so we, we need to, um, you know, I'm speaking as a white woman, um, and it's something that um, you know obviously isn't isn't my direct experience, but it's, it's very clear um, from from listening to to women of colour um, and and racialized women that we as to to tackle um, sexual violence means also taking measures to um, undermine the the pillars of colonisation um, and and racism. Um, in a similar way to, to the fact that we need to, to get rid of whorephobia in order to protect sex workers from the particular forms that violence takes against them. You know, um, there's, there's a, and you know, women with disability um, who also face uh, particular additional burdens of, of sexual assault and sexual violence. Um, and so uh, we need to transform our workplaces and transform our economy. We do need a new kind of economy that's egalitarian, that's that's socialised, um, and and we need to see the the socialist project as one of revolutionising everything, and that means all the relations that are oppressive, um, not just the economic ones. And I just wanted to make the point um, that representation and formal equality isn't enough. So you know, just simply getting more women onto boards or into parliament. Um, and, you know, getting them to pass good legislation clearly hasn't been enough and isn't going to be enough. Um, and we do see the sort of small, small L liberal, I guess, semi-progressive forces where affirmative action is all they've got to offer. Um, and, it, you know, it's all identity politics and just getting more women in. Um, but it isn't enough. Um, 
And if you think about the events of this week, despite everything that's happening in Parliament, all our female parliamentarians went to an International Women's Day event where the two speakers were the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and Anthony Albanese, the leader of the opposition. So what is going to change things is the strength of the grassroots movement, the women's liberation movement on the ground. And I would like to think that, um, you know, if we if we had something more established and if we'd been out on the streets like that immediately after, I would like to think that would have been enough pressure or would have given those women parliamentarians the courage to go get stuffed. I'm not going to come to your IWD event and listen to Scott Morrison um, or at least the more progressive ones may have, you know, come out and joined us on the street. Um, so I think that that extra parliamentary um, activity and grassroots action is absolutely crucial to creating a society where rape doesn't happen. And I'm so excited to hear this 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 conversation and this this dialogue. Um, and I look forward to harnessing the dialogue that I'm hearing here and taking it to Parliament. And um, I would like to see real change. Different workspaces. Tuesday, the 16th of March, is the day it changes. So I would like to thank everybody for your contributions here today. Uh, thanks everybody for your for your comments. This is an important issue and certainly at Green F we will be continuing to, to campaign for justice for women in every way we can. Uh, I would like to definitely encourage people to make it along to the Justice for Women marches on, on March 15 and also other uh, international women's day actions and, and whatever women's rights actions are happening in, in your locality. I would like to remind people once again that uh, we would appeal for your support. If you like the work you do, please become a Green F supporter. We're actually on a special uh, supporter drive at the moment. So for the next three weeks, we're, we're asking people extra, especially at this moment in time, would you please consider becoming a Green F supporter? And once again, that Green F 30th, uh, celebration, 30th anniversary celebration coming up on, on March 27th. So thanks everybody for joining us. Mm -hmm.